The Trudeau government says it may act against the provinces if the provinces move forward with legislation requiring schools to inform parents about gender changes. Now, to talk about this in more detail is political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, who joins us once again from Toronto. Brian, the Trudeau Liberals have issued the warning, but will the provinces comply? Parents say they want in. I, I, this was a very bizarre move by the Trudeau Liberals. Uh, first off, they have no constitutional jurisdiction over education. Uh, so I don't know how they would act to say, look, you can't have this school policy. Uh, this started with New Brunswick uh, de declaring back in, I think it was late May, that they were going to require uh, schools to inform parents if a child wanted to change their name, gender, or pronouns at school. What's happened over the last several years is school, uh, individual schools, school boards, school districts, depending on where you are and what they're called, they have come up with policies that say, if a child wants to change their gender or their pronouns at school, don't tell mom and dad unless you have the express consent of the child. And for example, here in Toronto, it, it specifically says in the policy, regardless of how young the child is. So it can be a four-year-old. Wow. Well, that's not something that sits well with parents. Uh, Justin Trudeau has tried to say that those that support this, and now it's uh, uh, New Brunswick has gone in this direction. Saskatchewan's uh, Scott Moe has said this will be policy. Ontario's education minister, Stephen Lecce, told me last week that he expects, he didn't say he was coming out with the policy, but he expects school boards to be open and transparent with parents and to in fully inform them. Um, but the prime minister has called this far right. And then Marcy Ian, his minister for women, gender equality and youth, came out and said that they may act. She gave the warning. Hey, we're watching you. Uh, and again, they, they portrayed this as a fringe position. It's actually the Trudeau Liberals that have the fringe position because it's only about 14, 15 percent of Canadians agree with the position of the government, which is that no, parents shouldn't be informed unless the child wants them to know. Wow. Uh, this is uh, an Angus Reid poll released last week showed that 78 percent of Canadians believe that parents have a right to be informed. Now, they did not, they were split on whether the parent should be. Uh, required to consent to any changes, but 78% said they must be informed. 82% of households with children under the age of 18 felt this way. So this is not a fringe position that the provinces are taking, but the federal government is taking a very fringe position, and I'm not sure what they would do, but this seems to be one of the, the many culture war issues that the Trudeau Liberals want to campaign on. Um, th this is what is driving them these days. It's, it's not the economy. It's not dealing with inflation. It's not the housing crisis. The, these are the issues. This and issuing travel warnings for LGBTQ uh, Canadians for going to the, the United States, that it's a dangerous place for them. These are the issues that animate them, and they seem to be offside many, many Canadians. Brian, speaking of travel, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in Indonesia. It's part of a tour which will see the PM make stops in Singapore and India as well. Now, Brian, you say that unlike other countries, Trudeau is not lecturing about carbon emissions or LGBTQ2 plus issues. Why do you think that is? Uh, because he is very selective. He's situational on his commitment to these issues. Indonesia is a major oil and gas producer. Uh, their carbon emissions, they're not quite as high as Canada's, but they have been going up. Don't expect them to go there and, and, and lecture um, them. Uh, and, and he won't uh, do the same. Like, like I just mentioned, the Trudeau government issued a warning to Canadians that America is a dangerous place for gays and lesbians. Um, I don't think anybody actually believes that, but they put that out there campaigning on it. And, and so when you know, I realized he was in Indonesia, I looked up, um, you know, it, what, is he going to lecture him the way that he did Italy's prime minister um, a few months ago? No, he's not going to lecture on these issues. He's not going to lecture on carbon the way he does Canada's provinces because it's very situational. Justin Trudeau isn't about governing and getting results other than electoral results. If he thinks saying or doing something will benefit him in terms of voter support, then he does it. Otherwise, he, he stays silent. And he likes to to you know, pick on Italy's prime minister, a woman, he likes to mansplain to her, but he's not going to go to a, 
a Muslim man who heads up a, a large country in Asia and lecture uh, him in the same way that he did Italy's prime minister. Last week, Federal Environment Minister Stephen Guibault was in China. Now, we earned a pretty strong rebuke from Alberta Premier Daniel Smith for being critical of the Alberta oil sands while in Beijing. But, Brian, isn't China one of the world's worst polluters? It's absolutely the worst polluter. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it's still on track for building uh, one to two coal-fired electrical plants per week. That's how many they're building. Meanwhile, you know, Stephen Guibault, before he left, was lecturing Daniel Smith and the province of Alberta on uh, still using fossil fuels. You know, Alberta is actually making great strides moving away from fossil fuels, but it's never going to be zero. Uh, the province doesn't have the, um, the hydroelectric capabilities of a British Columbia or Quebec. It, it's simply not feasible. Uh, so, he, you know, Guibault lectures um, Alberta, then goes to China as an advisor. Uh, executive vice president of a, a group that advises the Communist Party of China on climate. And then while he's there, he also starts uh, spouting off about Suncor. The uh, CEO of Suncor said, look, we're going to continue to invest in the oil sands. We're going to uh, use these assets. He also said that he was still committed to net zero by 2050, which is uh, their goal and has been for some time. So nothing changed. But Guibault, while in Beijing, decided to turn around and lecture Alberta. And, and then, just a few days later, while still in Beijing, started um, lecturing about Atlantic Canada's gas regulators. Um, each of the Atlantic provinces has a government agency that sets the price of gas. And he was lecturing them for allowing price increases at the beginning of July. Beginning of July, that's when Atlantic Canada got hit with the national price on carbon, the carbon tax plus the clean fuel standards, what Pierre Polyev calls the second carbon tax. So the price of gas went up. He lectured them saying they shouldn't have done that. That's the entire point of his policies, is to drive up the price of gas so that you use less of it. But, you know, Guibault, um, I don't know, playing uh, political games and attacking Canada from Beijing while not pointing out that they are the world's worst polluter. Brian, a lot of Canada will keep their eyes on Ottawa this week. The trial of Freedom Convoy organizers Tamara Leach and Chris Barber has begun in our nation's capital. It's expected to last around 16 days. Now, that doesn't really sound especially long considering the amount of charges that were laid. Well, it's, it, we're, we're talking about mischief charges, though, Hal. So this is a, a bizarre situation where uh, we've got the full weight of the state coming down on Tamara Leach and, and Chris Barber over mischief charges, uh, conspiracy to uh, council mischief, and, and, and charges like that. This is a, a show of force by the government, just like they used to show of force on the Emergencies Act. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm split on the Freedom Convoy. I know some people love it, think it was the best thing ever. I said to you at the time, look, they made their point, they should have left earlier, but I was against the Emergencies Act. I find this whole thing to be a bit of theater uh, from a time that most of us have forgotten. You know, we've moved on from the pandemic. We've moved on from the restrictions the convoy was fighting. But the people prosecuting this have not. Uh, Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson showed up early. Uh, he's going to be one of the witnesses. They spent a lot of time in the morning at the courthouse just setting up the ground rules, setting up the technology, establishing procedures. They're going to allow journalists to record the proceedings but only for note taking. And if you broadcast any of it or post it on social media, well, you're going to face consequences, it's things like that. But this is a very long drawn out procedure for charges that um, I, I, I'm not even sure should have been laid in the end. Now, Brian, the trial will still be going on when the House of Commons resumes sitting. That is, if it resumes right away, there's speculation that Parliament may not resume until later this month. Yeah, there's speculation that Justin Trudeau could prorogue. Um, I don't know what they're going to do on that. You know, the rumors have just started trying to get a sense of, okay, is this, uh, is this just people with idle gossip? Uh, is this them um, taking the temper temperature of the room? Remember, the, you know, prorogation is a, a normal tactic of government. It is there to reset, to have a, a throne speech, to establish a new parliament. There's nothing wrong with it. But of course, when Stephen Harper did it, they, they lost their minds over that. They made it sound like an awful, dirty word. They've used it themselves. They used it to get out of the wee charity scandal. 
they've had a really rough summer and they might do it then. Um, or they might look and say, depending on how the, uh, the, the Freedom Convoy trial is going, they might say, hey, we can use this as our advantage, get the Conservatives back in there, and we can attack them in the House of Commons. I could see that happening very much as well. Now, Brian, against the backdrop of the rising poll numbers we've seen recently, Pierre Polyev and the Tories will be meeting in Quebec City this week. Now, it's a policy conference, and the first time the party has held a convention since Polyev was elected as leader. What are you expecting to come out of this convention? Uh, well, I think uh, you're going to see a lot of excitement and anticipation and hope. And, you know, for anyone that was thinking that Pierre Polyev was the wrong choice for the Conservative leader, I think on this given weekend, you, you won't be hearing those voices because he is doing so well in the polls right now. If an election were held today, the federal Conservatives would win a majority government. Uh, that sort of momentum, uh, that creates unity, that creates discipline. There's going to be uh, some uh, policy discussions, though, and some motions that will be, some could be problematic, some could be um, uh, policy discussions that are actually opportunities, things like talking about freedom of speech, bodily autonomy. They could go either way, depending on how the discussion plays out, and we're going to see. But I think really a lot of, of, of unity and excitement uh, on this because they are riding so high in the polls right now and the Trudeau Liberals have taken a beating. Now you've been looking a little more in depth into some of the polling numbers here, Brian. Where has Pierre Pauly have been gaining a lot of support lately? In all the right places. You know, I've been saying uh, to you for a long time, Al, he's got to win over suburban mothers, especially in the Toronto area, in the Vancouver area, um, you know, <laughs> British Columbia is the reason that Justin Trudeau won the last election. So, you know, don't get, stop blaming Ontario and Toronto. You know, he's got to win in that lower mainland where the, the Conservatives used to do well. And he's doing that now. He's picking up. He's, he's well ahead of Justin Trudeau among, among female voters. He's long been well ahead of Justin Trudeau and the Liberals among males. But he's also picking it up in the right uh, age groups, uh, leading among 18 to 34 year olds in several polls, uh, leading in every region of the country except Quebec. That is impressive. But also, an interesting poll that came out just before Labor Day showed uh, Pierre Polyev leading among union members. Now, Angus Reid said, okay, you're a union household, you're a public sector worker or a union member or a private sector. Which party best represents uh, you as a union member? And, and the answer was Pierre Polyev. And the, the Trudeau Liberals were third. Just like the, the Trudeau Liberals are third among young voters, uh, Justin Trudeau's strongest support is among baby boomers now, and he's not even leading with them anymore. Brian, there was some online controversy over the weekend over a viral video of Pierre Polyev saying that Justin Trudeau and his father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, were both Marxists. Now, first of all, do we know if it's true? And secondly, do you think this will hurt the federal Tories? Um, it's the type of story that's a bit of a distraction and it's more likely to to gin up Trudeau supporters than harm him but it's also the type of thing that he should avoid uh just because he's winning over those swing voters right those people that cast their ballot with Justin Trudeau the last few elections that he's got to get them over to his side you don't want to give them any reason not to so that doesn't mean that you've got to be wooden but you know it's an offhanded remark well they're both Marxists uh, you know if you've seen the video that's literally how it is He's dismissive of them. I would say at one point, Pierre Trudeau uh, most likely would have identified as a Marxist or a communist of some type. He, he was very much on, on the far left, um, and he was described by some within his own party as he was seeking the leadership as a socialist. Is Justin Trudeau a Marxist? No, he doesn't think that deeply. Uh, but, you know, Pierre Polyev, as I said, just avoid those sorts of things. Um, speak to voters on the issues that matter to them and the fact that Justin Trudeau is hurting them financially right now, that inflation's not under control, that mortgage rates are uh, seeing 30% inflation, that food is seeing 10 to 20% inflation, depending on which metrics you're looking at, that these are the things that um, are driven in part by Trudeau's policies and that they need to be changed rather than flip comments uh, that um, his, you know, fear supporters uh, will find funny and they might agree with it. But um, you're always thinking about those swing voters and making sure that you're bringing them onto your side and not giving them a reason to uh, 
to reconsider or stay away from you. So Brian, let me ask you something. We've talked about this in the past. You've got your pulse in our nation's capital. Will we be seeing a fall or maybe even a winter or a spring election? Will Jagmeet Singh finally pull the plug on this coalition? I don't think so. And I think these polling numbers make it less likely. Um, you know, back in the end of May, we were discussing that the polls would show that if we had an election then, we would have ended up with the same parliament. Um, but then the Atlantic wall fell for Trudeau. Um, he's struggling in Quebec. He's lost support in Ontario and B.C. Uh, Pierre Polyev has gained that support, a lot of it. Jagmeet Singh is not benefiting from the main left of center party falling apart. Uh, so he is not in good shape to go to the polls. If, if you were Justin Trudeau, would you want to face the electorate when there's a good chance that you're going to get your party wiped out? Probably not. The, uh, some of the discussions I'm hearing in Ottawa right now are, does Justin Trudeau stick around? Uh, we've got a, a, a column that's about to run in the Toronto Sun from Stephen LeDrew, who was president of the Liberal Party back when Jean Chrétien was in charge. And LeDrew tells the story of how he went to visit Chrétien and said, look, your time is up. You've had a good run. It's time to step down. He doesn't see anyone around Trudeau uh, with enough gravitas to tell Trudeau, you've got to go. But, you know, so is there enough time for Trudeau to step down and let somebody else try and take over and salvage things? Or is it just going to be a bloodbath? And if it's going to be a bloodbath, he's going to hold on to power as long as he can. Uh, you know, it might remind me of Ontario in the, the mid-90s. Bob Ray went almost full five full years because he knew no matter when I call the election, we're going to be decimated with the NDP in Ontario. He was right. And they've never been the same since. Trudeau could be facing a similar sort of thing. Political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for joining us today from Toronto. Thank you.